Welcome, everybody. My name is Bill Hall. Welcome to this month's Cedar Hills Ready uh, Education Meeting. <clears throat> Tonight, we're going to be talking about urban wildfire, how outdoor fires in our neighborhood, uh, and uh, about preparing your yard and your house exterior, and about evacuation planning. This program tonight is brought to you by Cedar Hills Ready, Quake Up. And tonight we have some special speakers. Deputy Fire Marshals Stephanie McKee and Trace Richard from Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue District are here to help us understand those topics. Now we're gonna go over a lot of information tonight in a short period of time. You may wanna take notes, but don't worry about writing everything down because you'll have access to the slides and the lists that we're gonna show in this presentation and additional free resources on our website. We make our Get Prepared Now booklet, which you see on the left here, available to you for free on our website. Welcome back. Last month, we talked about barrels, supply caches, and water collection and treatment. Tonight, we're gonna focus on how to be prepared for the potential of wildfires spreading or breaking out in our neighborhoods. Last year's extreme weather and near, nearby wildfires and this summer's early heat wave and the wildfire breakouts uh, that we see today have made us pause to think about vulnerabilities in our grass and tree-filled neighborhoods in the urbanized area. Uh, we are gonna follow this session up with another meeting on indoor fire prevention in October. But tonight we're gonna focus on the outdoors. For those of you who attended our Neighborhood Ready presentation last month, you might recall the story of Peter Scott and his 85-year-old mother, Frances, who died in the 1991 Oakland Hills fire. If you look at the top left picture on this slide, that's uh, the suburban community that I'm talking about before the fire. And if you look at that, you just might imagine the look of Beaverton. But we don't want our Beaverton look like the bottom picture, which is the same neighborhood after that fire burned 2,500 homes and killed over 100 residents. We can avoid that by being prepared. And that's what we're trying to do tonight. So here's our agenda. We're gonna have our main presentation by the Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue Team covering the basics of fire behavior, how to be best prepared for a wildfire and community action. Then we'll shift to what we can do this summer and break into discussion groups to develop some ideas for action and then come back and close before the ending uh, with a brief question and answer period. Let's get started. I am honored to introduce to you our speakers for tonight. Stephanie McKee and Trace Richard are Deputy Fire Marshals in Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue's Fire Prevention Unit, also known as the Fire Life Safety Team. And they are a key part of the Fire District's Community Risk Reduction Team. They are specialists in urban wildfire interface and the behavior of fire in extreme weather conditions. Now we've asked them to share the basics with us and talk about what we can do in our neighborhoods to be maximally prepared for another scary summer in green tree-filled Washington County. We are delighted and honored to have this tag team of specialists with us tonight. Hi everybody, I'm Trace uh, Richard. A uh, little background about me, I've been in the fire service for about 16 years, um, eight, eight years at uh, Tualatin Valley as a deputy fire marshal and also started my fire service career um, as a student down in Estacada and I am well versed in um, wildland suppression because we did a lot of it down there and also uh, prevention stuff because I ended my career there with uh, working in their fire marshals. We're gonna get started here. Uh, this is a bunch of slides on urban wildfire risk. There's gonna be a lot of pictures, examples. Um, so it encompasses a large variety of homes because we have some lots that are small, some lots that are big. So whatever fits your lot, let's go with that. Okay, what we're going to cover, we're going to do urban versus rural, basics of fire, structural and brush fires, as well as wildfires. We're going to go over um, the Ready, Set, Go program that the state of Oregon has adopted. Uh, and it's basically preparing your home and landscape planning. Uh, Planning is a, a key piece 
in this whole program and putting your action plan in together. And then we'll touch a little bit on the Firewise communities. All right, so definitions, urban, uh, it's more of a developed density, homes, businesses, roads, infrastructures. And these areas have uh, fire hydrants. And so they have a reliable water source. In the rural areas is basically uh, limited populations and is less than a thousand inhabitants or structures in the area and they're intermixed with the wooded and forested areas. On the fire side, uh, so urban fires, most of the fires actually happen inside, um, inside homes. And uh, if you join us in October, we will be going over that and how you can reduce chances of your house catching on fire from the inside. And then um, in the urban area, we have brush fires and are usually alongside roadways or streets. In the rural areas, they're more of a wildfire. There's, there's dense wooded areas. Um, some of the challenges there are is access because there's not very, not very many roads out there. Um, there's no reliable water, so we bring our water with us, and they usually burn for a while before someone actually sees them. All right, so basics of fire, you need uh, three things for a, a fire, heat, fuel, and oxygen. Fuel is what burns, basically. Um, oxygen, we have all around us, and heat. Heat is the ignition source, and ignition sources can be mechanical, chemical, or thermal. Uh, there's another triangle, it's called the wildfire behavior triangle. So you see fuel is in there again, so there's types of fuels. There are light fuels like uh, uh, pine needles and leaves, sticks, twigs, logs, trees, and also your home. So um, your home is a fuel because it can burn. Um, also topography and weather affect fire as well. So um, the weather part, there are winds, there are a, a temperature that can be high temperatures, dry the fuel out, winds can blow um, and dry the fuel out faster. Um, and also slope. So fire moves uphill faster. Topography and weather are big, are large variables on how fire spreads. And the only thing that we can control is the fuels by removing them or reducing them. All right, so complications of wildfire in the Wui area. For, for those that don't know uh, what uh, Wui is, it's a wildland urban interface area. Well, like I said before, Wildfires create their own weather. They're in remote areas. Uh, the access is a ch challenge, water supply, and the density of fuels because those areas haven't burned in a really long time. Um, and then you put homes intermixed and that just complicates things more. Uh, let's see, the challenges uh, for urban interface areas. This is the Alameda fire down in between Ashland and Medford. Um, this was a perfect storm uh, that happened down there. Um, and also in that first picture of, of the Berkeley Hills fire down in Oakland, uh, both were perfect storms, long heat, long spell of high heat, low humidity, drought conditions, and high winds. Urban fires, um, are a challenge, but uh, from those Berkeley Hill fire, city, county, and fire departments have learned so much from that. There are a lot of things that happened down in the Oakland Hills fire that were challenges that today, those things are basically fixed. It can happen, but uh, we're going to go over some things to, to, to help reduce your chances of that happening in your area. All right, so how we respond. So uh, these are our normal apparatus. We have medic units there. You see those everywhere. We have our trucks and engines and our car. Car is a unique apparatus, so it can 
get through traffic and into uh, areas faster than the big rigs and they can size a scene up and request more resources if needed. Urban firefighting, so structural firefighting, we use water to cool what's burning. We use uh, uh, saws to cut holes in the roof to ventilate all of the heat and the hot gases out of the house so we can enter to put the fire out. Outdoor fires, we, we do the same thing. Um, we use the water to cool things down, but in the urban areas, uh, I mean, in the wildland areas, we also use shovels and heavy equipment to make fire breaks so that the fires don't spread. Slide. So what can we do as homeowners? Stephanie, I'll let you take over. All right, and just a quick introduction. I'm Stephanie McKee, also Deputy Fire Marshal that works with Trace in our Community Risk Reduction Group. Um, I came from Arizona, so I'm used to a lot of dry weather and wildfires there as well. Um, I've been here the last seven years, so a little bit of a change with the, all the trees, but the trees down there burn just as just as fast and, and just as hot. So uh, now we're going to talk about our Ready, Set, Go program. And our Ready, Set, Go program is really designed to get homeowners prepared for wildfire. It's things you can do at home, plans you can make, and then really understanding the levels of wildfire evacuation. So with Ready, we're going to talk about defensible landscaping zones and home hardening. So defensible space is a word that you may or may not have heard before, but it's very important for preventing your home from having a wildfire affect your home. Um, so you want to, there's different defensible space zones. So with Ready, Set, Go, they look at two zones. Zone one is the zero to 30 feet zone. And in zone two, it's 30 to 100 feet. And FireWise, we're going to talk a little bit more about at the end, but FireWise is a national program for defensible space, wildfire prevention. And with FireWise, there are three zones that they recognize. The immediate zone is zero to five feet. Uh, five to 30 feet is the intermediate zone. And then the extended zone is 30 to 100 feet. Today, we're going to talk about three different zones. And these pictures here, it's just, again, showing a little bit more examples of the difference between a rural setting and an urban setting. With the rural setting, you have more land than you have homes and kind of infrastructure. In that urban setting, you can see that there are planned streets there and the infrastructure is in place and it's about equal with the homes and the landscape. All right, so in defensible space, zone one, this is going to be the area up against the home. So zero to five feet from your home. In this area, it's really important that we reduce combustibles. So one of the things you wanna do is make sure that any trees are not overhanging your roof line or up against your house up to 10 feet. So as we all know, not only do we have the wildfires here, but I'm sure many of us were affected by the ice storm in February. And that's kind of normal for every winter, at least from the fireside. We tend to go on several, depending on the year, several different calls for tree limbs in houses or on cars. And so this is important just to prevent that from happening as well, not just wildfire. So make sure that you don't have any tree limbs up against the roof and against the structure itself. So 10 feet clearance there. And then you want to remove any flammable plants or shrubs that are near your windows, because if they do catch fire, um, they could potentially break the window and then get the catch the inside of your house on fire, which we obviously don't want. This area, too, we want to clear the tree needles, bark, pine cones, any of that other debris from your foundation and also from your gutters. In defensible space zone two, uh, this is the five to 30 feet zone. So here it's important to use fire resistive plants if you're looking at planting anything. On our website, which we'll share at the end of our presentation, um, but it's www.tvfr.com slash wildfire. There is towards the bottom, there is a fire resistant plant guide. It's I think 152 pages. So there are a lot of options. Basically a fire resistive plant is going to be one that holds more moisture, is not as woody, like blackberries, um, lavender, are just a couple of examples of a really woody kind of plant that can burn quickly. And so fire resistant plants just are, hold moisture a little better and aren't going to burn as quickly as some of the others. 
In this area, again, you want to clear those leaves, needles, pine cones, and that other kind of natural debris that falls from trees and other vegetation. We don't want to keep any wood piles in this zone. So wood piles should be located at least 30 feet away from your house or any kind of garage or shed structure. And then in this zone, keep your grass green if you can and keep it no higher than four inches. So keep it mowed. And we recommend mowing first thing, well, this time of year, first thing in the morning before about 10 o'clock where the moisture is a lot higher and the temperatures are cooler, right? In zone three, this is the extended zone. So 30 to 100 feet or more, depending on your property. So we can't express enough how important a healthy tree canopy is. So living here in Oregon, we all love our trees. We love our forest. Think about if you ever go for a hike or go for a walk in like a natural kind of forested area. The nice thing about doing that is it's shaded, it's cooler, it tends to be a little bit more humid, but those cooler kind of temperatures. So in a healthy forested area, those are all good things that can help withstand a quick spreading fire or a wildfire because those are not the ideal conditions for a wildfire. Um, so if we do have trees or kind of a forested area on our property, we want to make sure that we're keeping those as healthy as possible. So some of the ways that we do that are getting rid of those invasive species like the blackberry bushes. Um, ivy is another one. So both of those things can kind of choke out the trees. They can take over and actually ivy, it doesn't seem like it, but it can get very, very heavy growing along the tree trunk. And it can actually kind of suffocate those trees and make for an unhealthy tree. So getting rid of those is really important. And then in this area, we want to clear any ladder fuel. So what a ladder fuel is, it's something that starts low, something along the ground and has the potential to carry fuels or carry fire up the tree trunks and all the way up to that canopy. So we wanna prevent that from happening. Um, so one of the ways that we do that is keeping a clearance of six feet from any fuels along the ground. Um, so keep, keep a clearance six feet between those fuels and any tree limbs or other vegetation. And then here we wanna thin those ground materials as well, all of the tree droppings like the pine cones, needles, leaves, et cetera. Here's a good picture of kind of a before and after of somebody doing those fuel reductions. So think about if you're going to have a fire and you have a firewood, it takes a lot to really catch those logs on fire. So that's why we often wanna use kindling to help the fire get going. All the stuff that we've removed in that after picture is all kindling basically. And so thinning those out is going to help uh, fire from spreading rapidly through this area. Another example, the picture on the left, I think shows a great example of a ladder fuel. So those um, branches kind of sticking out from that trunk, those kind of look like ladder rungs. So think of it like that. Um, those should all be removed. If you've gone through an area that has been devastated by wildfire, a lot of those healthy, older, mature trees are fine. They may have some surface burning on the, the trunks themselves, but those trees will be fine. Those trees will stand for a long time. Um, and so removing those ladder fuels will help those trees also because it's not allowing the flames to spread up the tree trunks. In the picture on the right, you can see where those flames are actually going up, whether it's from ivy that was on there or just kind of those scraggly uh, twigs that are growing along those trunks. All right, so in the zero to five feet zone, this is extremely important and this picture could not depict it better. So you can see all of those firebrands or embers that are blowing towards that house. So in a wildfire, embers can carry up to a mile. And so having that defensible space, having your home hardened is super important for preventing those embers from igniting anything against your house. So we talk about clearing off any combustibles on your roof. This includes moss. Make sure you're doing your moss treatment or get your roof cleaned. Um, clearing off any of that vegetation like the pine needles, pine cones, leaves, etc. And then keeping your gutters clear. Um, we recommend doing that before fire season starts. Typically, we've been saying about May or June, but it's been starting earlier this year, especially. So maybe about April or May is a good time to look at doing that. And then in this zone as well, you want to make sure that you don't have the combustible vegetation, bark dust, um, anything like that that can burn up against your house.
All right. So I already kind of talked about this a little, but here's a good picture of just kind of a normal house in the Pacific Northwest where the trees are dirty and drop that stuff on our roofs. So we want to keep those clean. If you do have, well, we all have gutters. I don't know why I said if you do, um, but with gutters, if you have vinyl gutters, you may want to consider replacing those with metal. The vinyl gutters will burn much more easily than the metal ones. And then when it comes to really any surface on your house, um, we get a lot of calls and questions about cedar shake roofs, which are very combustible. Um, but it is, that was what a lot of places used for a long time here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so if you are in that phase where you're looking to replace your roof, just consider materials like composite that are going to be more fire resistant. And then same thing with your siding. Hardy is going to be fire resistant compared to like the cedar shake siding um, and some of the others. But just look into those kind of more fire resistant materials, especially if you live in the more rural areas where a wildfire is a much bigger potential. So we want to protect our exterior walls in this area. The non-combustible siding, like I mentioned, like hardy board, um, use that at least six inches from the ground. So even home inspectors will tell you, you want to have a, a six inch clearance at least from the ground to your first um, piece of siding. You want to allow your foundation walls to kind of breathe um, here we've got rocks in place, and that's what we would recommend for a non-combustible surface. Bark dust against the house really can be problematic in a wildfire. If you don't want to put rock down, another alternative is just removing bark dust or whatever is there um, and making sure that it's just mineral soil. Mineral soil will not sustain combustion, so mineral soil or rocks are a good fire-resistant um, landscape that you can have in this area. So most of us probably have whether it's attic vents or foundation wall vents or both. Um, and with those, there's typically quarter inch mesh covering on those. That's kind of the norm. We want to um, actually use one eighth inch mesh because with quarter inch mesh, the embers can get through there and they'll still have enough energy left over to ignite the inside of, of that opening. But with one eighth inch mesh, the embers can get through, but then they don't have enough energy left to ignite anything. So if you have, like in this picture, you could easily take those off and replace those with the 1 8 inch mesh. With your foundation vent wells, that is a lot harder to remove those, but you can just put that 1 8 inch mesh over the existing mesh and that will help give you some protection there. We're also seeing too, um, a lot of the attic gable vents, they don't have any sort of mesh or screening behind them. So we recommend putting that in place as well to help prevent those embers from getting into that attic space. Right, so something that you probably have never thought about, but we wanna think about our patio furniture. Obviously metal is going to be a lot better than plastic, but it can also be heavier. Um, if you are looking to buy patio furniture, consider materials like metal that are going to be fire resistant. If you have plastic furniture, the good thing about that is ideally it's easy to move, but that's something where when you're making your plan and Trace is going to cover the plan part of it, but when you're making your plan for evacuation, you wanna have a checklist if you have time. And so in that checklist, one of the things is going to be removing all the combustibles from against your house. And so if it's plastic and you can easily move it, that would be helpful here. If you have cushions or anything on your patio furniture, um, especially your metal stuff, you just want to be able to easily remove it and put it inside. In this area, floor mats, feet mats, door mats, <laughs> uh, any plastic um, pots, those are all things that could ignite. So just limit that stuff as much as possible if you can, or just keep in mind that that may be stuff that you need to move out of the way if there is a fire in your area or move it inside. All right, so fences, we all know the norm here is cedar fencing. And it's pretty difficult to think of other materials, really. But this picture, I think, does a really good job of showing a good alternative where you still have the privacy of having the cedar fence, but that small area where it attaches to the house is with metal. And so if the fence was to catch on fire, it doesn't have that straight line of fire going to your house. So this is what's recommended for fire resistance with your fencing. If you have... Um, one of the fences I saw the other day, it had, they had uh, wood fence posts with metal in between. So if that's the case, just again, don't have bark dust all the way up to the posts, but kind of 
dig it down to regular mineral soil or have rock around it so that that can't ignite if there are embers. All right, decks can be problematic because a lot of people tend to store things underneath them or these are areas where you're not being super mindful of weeds and vegetation. So in these areas, we wanna have non-combustible surfaces like rocks or that mineral soil again. And then if you do have a deck, we recommend screening it. So you can do that with the hardy board, which is non or sorry, fire resistant or with that uh, mesh screening, the one eighth inch mesh screening. And then just don't, don't have any storage underneath the deck. That's the other thing that you can do to help, right? And then here is a good example of what we don't wanna do. If there's a fire in your area, you really don't want to uh, have to worry about removing all of that stuff. But all of that, are those are fuels and especially plastic. Uh, us in the fire service, we consider plastic like solid gasoline. It burns very quickly and very hot. So these are all things that you can do now to give yourself kind of a head start if there was to be a fire, getting rid of some of that extra stuff that you maybe don't need or use. So with addressing, from a regular fire standpoint, about 80% of our calls are actually medical calls. And so we live in a great area era of technology and we do have great mapping that routes us to our calls, but that can only go so far. And so we need that visual confirmation that we are in the right place. And so make sure that we can see your address number from the street, um, especially if you live in a rural area. We don't want to turn down a very long, narrow driveway just to find out that we're at the wrong place. That's stopping us from getting to the real emergency quickly and efficiently. Efficiently. So have it at the end of your driveway. We want to make sure that it's visible from both sides of traffic, both lanes of traffic, and that it's reflective or lit so that it, we can see it at night. There's also no um, weeds or anything blocking it as well. So more examples of hardening your home. We also need to get to the call quickly and safely. And so with your passenger vehicle, with this driveway, you may have zero problems getting in and out of your driveway. Think about the UPS guy. Can he get in there easily to give you your Amazon packages? If he struggles or if it's hitting the top of his truck, it's definitely gonna hit our fire engines or apparatus. And so our fire engines and apparatus are very expensive and they have very important life-saving equipment on them. So we really don't want to damage those apparatus. Um, so here we recommend keeping the roadway or your driveway, the whole width of it clear from vegetation. And then also we want it cleared up 13 and a half feet so that we're not damaging our equipment. If we were to come to an overgrown driveway like this, especially in a rural area, it could prevent us from going down that driveway to provide structure protection. So consider that. And then if there are any um, required turnarounds, like we call them hammerheads, um, but basically they, when a a community is designed and built, there may be specific areas that are required for fire apparatus to turn around and they would be signed and they would tell you that. If you have one near you, just make sure that it is being kept clear that people aren't parking in them or people aren't using them for storage. All right, Trace is going to talk about SET now. All right, so SET is making plans and preparing and you can do this alongside of doing your defensive space and home hardening. So it's creating an evacuation plan, a communication plan, making a checklist of things that you need to do before you evacuate and also creating emergency supply kits um, for each person in your, your home and your pets if you have them. And this uh, sheet that says set, that is on our website as well. Next slide, all right. So creating an evacuation plan for your household. Everyone is, every household is different. It's dynamic. You need to make an emergency plan for your specific household that, that fits your home and your family. So having a meeting place outside of your neighborhood, um, figuring that out, uh, figuring out different routes out of your neighborhood. I'm a creature of habit, so out of my neighborhood in Newburgh, I take the same way in and out every single time. But there's about five or six routes out of 
my neighborhood, but as a creature of, of habit, we always take the same one. So if there's an evacuation in your neighborhood, everybody is going to be taking the same exits that they usually take. So knowing different routes help not clog up the roads and stuff. You can print maps out, make sure that you know different routes out. Um, plan for, for your pets or large animals if you have them. Hotels, make sure that um, if you're staying in, in a hotel that they that you know that that hotel takes pets. Same with friends or family. If they're allergic to pets, make sure that you can bring your pets with you. If you live on a larger parcel of land and, and you have horses or any other livestock, plan for those as well. How are you going to get those out? How are you going to evacuate them? Create a communication plan. Have an out of area friend or relative be a main contact. You can text. A group text is, is best. That way everybody uh, gets the same inf information and that out of area person serves at a serves as a single resource in case you're in an area where the cell towers don't work. Okay, prepare a checklist of things that you need to do before you uh, before you evacuate. Um, things that you can do now to help out is uh, sign up for public alerts. Uh, get a portable radio or scanner. Uh, know where your shutoff valves are for uh, natural gas. Assemble your your emergency kits for each person. You can have go bags as backpacks, um, and also have an extra kit in your car just in case you're out of the area. You're at work and you can't make it back home. At least you have something to get you through until you can reignite with your family or go back home. And then another good information app is called Pulse Point um, and you can sign up. Um, it's a free app for your phone. You can sign up uh, to, to get alerts from our fire district um, and then you can actually see what calls that we are on. And if there is a fire, you know where it's at. Um, so making an, an emergency supply kit. So this is kind of like your 72 hour kit. So have clothing and food for people and pets. Um, uh, you can keep important documents in here, copies of them. Um, most of our information is on the computer now. So you can back it up on a, on a thumb drive and and uh, and keep it in there uh, extra prescriptions extra eye glasses pictures um, and and some extra cash or ATM card or credit cards just for emergencies um, and then also think about a a fireproof safe a small one that you can keep things in so if you are needing to evacuate you can just grab it and go or if you have a house fire you have um, your important stuff in that fireproof safe so those things are safe in case of a house fire or you have to evacuate stephanie you're going to go over this i am so the final stage of ready, ready set go is the evacuation stage so this is important to familiarize yourself with the evacuation levels. I know in September, because we hadn't really dealt with this in our area here, and honestly, up until a couple of few months ago, till we really started doing this almost every day in my world, I was like, okay, is a level one where we go or is a level three? So just familiarizing yourself with them and what that actually means is really important. All right, so level one is your be ready zone. And before I get into these two, just keep in mind that these are recommended levels and you can always leave earlier than the level three. You can leave at any time. And actually leaving earlier is kind of preferred and actually sometimes better because especially if a lot of you folks are in the Cedar Hills area, it can be a little bit more congested than maybe a rural area. And so if a lot of folks are evacuating that area, 
those roads can be, can get kind of congested if you wait until that level three zone. So you're just going to give yourself some more time and a, a little less stress if you leave at an earlier level. Um, so level one, be ready. This is your pre-evacuation preparedness stuff. So relocate those flammable items from outside. So like I talked about the patio furniture, your floor mats outside, any of those plastic pots, if you've got them against the house or on decks or porches. Um, you wanna turn off your propane tanks, turn off your natural gas, if you're aware of how to do that. Um, move any of your barbecue grill or your smokers appliances away from the house. Connect your hoses to a water source. We don't want you to turn them on, especially if you live in an urban area, because if everyone turns on their hoses, that can actually drop the water pressure for the municipal water supply that we need to connect to, to fight the fire. So we don't want you doing that. Um, it is good if that's something that you are concerned about. It's better to actually just be proactive. And, and like I mentioned in the home hardening part, water the grass closest to your house, keep all of the plants and everything closer to your house, green and healthy. And that will help you um, as opposed to that last minute kind of trying to wet everything down. If you're in a rural setting, there are things that you can do, but I think most of the folks in this are in the urban setting. Um, we're going to provide our email address. So if you are interested in some of that stuff, feel free to reach out at the end, or you could ask it at the end too, but we'll just leave it to the, the urban folks right now. So don't turn on any sprinklers or anything um, because it can drop the water pressure for us. In this stage, you want to open the lines of communication. So start your group text with the folks in your communication plan, and then consider relocating those large animals if you have um, any kind of farm animals or, you know, let's say you have 10 cats and you want to get them out. That's definitely start at this stage. If you have those things kind of needing extra time or maybe a loved one who is medically fragile or has a wheelchair or something that's going to take a little bit more time. Okay. And level two, this is your B set level. This is kind of your final preparation. And then keep in mind, this is all if you have time, if there is a very quick moving fire, level one through three may go in a matter of minutes. So this is just, if you have time and if you're kind of waiting around for that final uh, warning to go, these are all things that you can do to just kind of further prepare your house and yourselves. Um, so in this stage, make sure that each person has their evacuation kit, pull those final remaining combustibles inside or away from your house. Um, so what this means is if you can't easily move your patio table inside, just if you can move it in the lawn or in your yard as far away from your home as possible, that will be helpful. Again, relocate those large animals if you didn't do it in the first step. And then you wanna to listen to your local media sources for the affected areas and impacts. I know in September, because I also live in Newburgh, so we were close to the Shehalem fire and it, we wanted to make sure that we were up to date on everything going on. So I checked multiple sources just to make sure I was in the loop. Um, hopefully things will be more streamlined if we do have another incident. I think everybody in the area learned from September, but what I have found to be the most accurate um, with law enforcement tends to be, and even us, um, Twitter for these folks tends to be the most accurate because they can easily set up, send out a tweet letting you know about road closures or affected areas. You don't have to have Twitter to, to see those tweets. So you can just go to Google and put in, you know, Washington County Sheriff Twitter, and it would come up so you can kind of see those things. Um, on our wildfire webpage, we will have an incident map showing any active wildfires in our area. The state is also working on a statewide um, alert program, but right now it's in the beta testing. So um, that's not really ready yet for everybody, but that's something that will come out as well. And then... Let's see. Oh, as I mentioned before, you don't have to wait for that level three to leave. You are more than welcome to leave in this stage as well. So level three, this is your go now stage. Do not be this man on the roof. I don't think he's a popular person. That's not a smart person to be. Uh, you don't want to be that guy. When you're getting ready to leave in this stage, um, it's important to wear natural fabric clothing in case you are 
in a situation where you're kind of stuck or you you have to drive through the fire essentially, or you you end up being closer than you want to be. So natural materials like cotton are going to be a lot safer. If you're wearing synthetic materials, they can actually melt to your skin. And especially in a wildfire with those hot temperatures, you don't want that. Um, here, you want to close up your house, completely shut all the doors and windows. That's going to be a good line of defense from getting those embers or keeping those embers out of your home. Again, monitor those media sources, news, Twitter, um, social media, all of those can help you identify if you need to leave or what impacted routes there are. Um, and so keep in mind too, with the evacuations, we are going to be focusing on the fire and our law enforcement partners are awesome because they are the ones who help us with the evacuation notices. So I'm gonna share my experience again because these are things that I learned from this. So. I, my cell phone did not work during the Shalem fire because of the wind. I think it affected my cell tower. So thankfully I have a good relationship with my neighbors. We kept in communication. They let me know that we were at a level one. It was nighttime. I needed to go to bed. So I normally sleep with a white noisemaker on. Well, I really didn't want to sleep through the police knocking on my door. So that night I slept with my window open so I could hear if there was anything going on. And then I also made sure that my cell phone was on. I could hear it if any alerts came through or any fault, uh, phone calls came through and all of that. So some of those things that we're not normally thinking of, if your phone automatically goes to do not disturb or you put it on silent at night when you sleep, if there's a fire in the area, think of those things and make sure that you're going to be able to be woken up if something does happen in the middle of the night. Um, so another thing to do during this stage is leave your house light on. We all saw how dark it got in those areas, especially close to the fire. Um, it will help our crews. We, if we can see a house light on, we know, again, that confirmation that there's a structure there and that we need to protect that structure. So we're going to talk about the uh, uh, ready, set, go. It's for the individual homeowner and the firewise. Um, it is a national program put on by the uh, National Fire Protection Agency. It's called Firewise. And so right at it goes for the individual homeowner for, for tasks to do for their home or property. So every homeowner can be prepared. So FireWise, um, it focuses on a community-based fire prevention, fire fuel mitigation focus activities. Uh, uh, there's about eight, eight things that, that a community needs to do and have to start going down the certification of a firewise community and one of those is an assessment of homes in your community uh, that the fire department does uh, it'll either be stephanie or me um, and also the firewise website is firewise.org it it has a lot of great education education resources um on fuel mitigation in our service area we have uh four uh certified firewise communities they're all in westland um the picture there is sherry palmer she is the uh the the lead lead or organizer of the skyline ridge neighborhood in westland they were just uh certified as a firewise community uh last year in 2020 I think Stephanie and I and, I and our uh, our coworker Patrick did the community assessment out there. I think in April or May, and then I think they got certified in October. Um, so um, it's a community. So Firewise is a community-led initiative. Um, it's positive collaboration between neighbors uh, to take action before a, a fire happens. It encourages uh, fire planning. It enhances prevention in your neighborhood, uh, prevention, response, and recovery from a fire. And if you are certified um, as as a firewise community, you get access to national grants and grant op op opportunities for wildfire safety projects like fuel mitigations. Uh, you can contest at, contact at education at tdfnr.com. Our website is right there. There's also a 
QR code that takes you to our website with lots of great fire prevention tips and education materials as long as well as the fire resistive plant guide. Cedar Hills Ready is going to have this recording available, but we are also teaching this program monthly and you can find out or sign up and see the class schedule on our website as well. So if you know of somebody that might be interested in watching this in the future, please feel free to share it. So we'll let Bill take it back. Okay. Thank you so much, Stephanie and, uh, and Trace. That is a lot of important information. And we obviously are going to be integrating this into our general program for preparedness uh, and looking forward to another fire presentation in October, focusing on inside the house. We are not in the traditional wildfire areas and our fire department has a different set of protocols and equipment to respond to fires in our area as Stephanie and, and Trace described, but there are definitely some risks of wildfire in our neighborhood. I just took a walk uh, the other day through the Sanctuary of Furs, which is a few blocks away off Butner Road, which is about an acre of 100 foot fir trees within uh, about 10 feet of a half dozen Beaverton homes. Fireworks, a backyard barbecue, an errant spark from some tool, plus a high wind, we could be looking at a big fire and a zillion flying embers. A lot of Beaverton looks like this. So tonight, uh, everybody think for a few minutes and write down a personal list of project ideas that you got from Stephanie and Trace tonight. What are some of the things that you and I can do this summer to get better prepared. Creating defensible space, uh, removing combustible fuels, uh, preparing a communication plan, a go bag list, an evacuation plan. What are the things that uh, you want to do um, and uh, uh, come out of this at, at minimum, everybody, what's the one thing you might do in August to be more prepared for this summer? suggesting that that you start you think about your own plan and then put those things into into chat okay we've got clean the gutters and replace with rain guard uh suzanne ebert suggests uh clearing all fuel away from the home she's going to do that uh charlene wilson is trimming her branches away from her house judy is uh moving the firewood storage further from the house uh, and uh, Megan is going to come up with a communication plan. This is great, guys. And Deb Jones is going to review for plastics and assess a better storage system. Susan is uh, have a go bag ready for yourself and your pets. Rock along the foundation from Melody. Uh, replace the singer. This is great. Uh, just just noticing the number of ideas and um, actions that people are going to take this. Thank you guys for doing this, not only for yourself, but also for everyone else around you. It's wonderful. One of the things too, I want to add, because we get people that feel very overwhelmed because they feel like there are so many things that they have to change because this was never on our radar before. Uh, Trey says it best. This is a marathon, not a sprint. And so any actions that you can do are going to help get you in a better spot. This may take a few years to get into the perfect you know, home hardening area or, or place, but anything you can do is going to be an improvement for sure. Absolutely. Uh, I'd like to tell you what's up for our next meeting because it actually includes some of what we talked about tonight. We're gonna to spend the month of August going uh, through what we just discussed. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and then in September, we're gonna bring a greater focus, uh, focus on the topic of emergency documents and family communications in a disaster. Uh, not only uh, is this important for fire situations, but for earthquakes and floods and other emergency situations. What critical documents are you gonna need to preserve in a fire or a flood or an earthquake? Do you have copies of your passport, your ID, your bank accounts, uh, contact lists for insurance or regular bills to be paid and other critical items that you may need to retrieve quickly in the event that you suddenly lose contact with your files at home. Do you have a central contact outside uh, our area for communications? Come prepared with your ideas in September at our meeting for what's most important to you. Uh, oh, one more thing, uh, the, the um, resources, the online resources for wildfire uh, information 
is available on our website, available for you to do a further research. And here's a sample of those uh, URLs. Okay, it's time for Q&A. All right, Barbara. We had several questions, thank you. We had several questions come in while Stephen and, and Trace were talking. Um, I think many of these have been answered. Cindy asked about what mineral soil is and Trace answered just to say bare dirt, but with no organic materials. So no needles or leaves or uh, pine cones sitting on top of the soil. And that's what you want to um, have close to your home if uh, rocks are not a, a great alternative. Nancy asked about ceramic pots are okay. Trace, Trace answered yes, just to eliminate those plastic pots that may burn or melt. The pulsepoint.org app was listed on the chat. Uh, speaking of what was what the fire districts were doing, uh, what calls they're on and their current location. Um, Firewise, the fire, the, I'm sorry, the community certification, if you want to have your community certified uh, that would allow some additional um, ideas your neighborhood could do and then actually offer some advantages for your community, including uh, grants, grant fund money. Um, and that is firewise.org and that was listed. A question by Marissa, what for Stephanie and Trace, what can renters and complex uh, residents do to prepare for urban fire? So I would say the most important thing you can do is create your um, evacuation plan and your communication plan so that you are prepared in that manner and have your, your go bags or your uh, ready kits ready. Part of mine and Trace's jobs are to do inspections at um, commercial properties. And I would say that if you have a good relationship with the manager and you notice something that they could do to help, you know, casually mentioning it to, it to the manager could be helpful. Like, let's say that there is a lot of, um, you know, fallen limbs or something from the ice storm that could be a fire problem. You could mention it, but I, I know from <laughs> kind of what we deal with, that doesn't always go well when you tell a manager, especially if you say, well, the fire department said it's probably not going to go the best. But if you do have a good relationship and just mention it or, you know, say, hey, we took this class with the fire department. They were talking about it. Um, it might be something helpful for our community. You can always do that. Um, there's not anything code wise that they from an enforcement standpoint that we can do to make them become, you know, more fire wise from uh, wildfire stuff, but really kind of that self-preparation is going to be the best thing you can do. Anything to add to that, Trace? Yeah, no, um, Steph, I think you summed it up n n nicely. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's hard to get other people to do things, but if you take care of yourself, that's the best, the best thing that you can do is take care of you, your, you and your family. Um, if you have relationships with your neighbors, um, it becomes a lot e easier because you're not relying on just yourself that you have partners in this. So um, that's what, what, what I would recommend. Um, okay, thank you. David asked the, uh, the reference that you made to the non-Twitter source and uh, the answer came across as the pulse point. I think what he was referring to was the Washington County to Google, Washington County Twitter. Um, I, I think that's what you were asking for, David, was the Washington County Twitter and just Google that. And then there was a question about the, the suggested type of mask for smoke. And I believe it was Stephanie ans or, or Karen answered a, an N95 because the fabric masks don't really keep out smoke particulates. We do need an N95 if you're especially um, sensitive to smoke. Question that I see here, any preferable type of gutter guard to prepare for fire? Um, just make sure it's non-combustible. Any of the, the metal ones would be a good call. And those are great. Um, so that you're not having to do that constant maintenance of cleaning out your gutters. 
just with those on, don't think that you're good to go. I mean, consider that you still may have debris on the peaks and valleys of your roof, but that's definitely going to make your job a lot easier if you don't, if you're not having to clean out your actual gutters. And one of the things actually that's, uh, that I'd like uh, Stephanie to speak to is you mentioned in last time we talked that right now trimming your, you know, taking down stuff is not a great idea. It's better to wait until the colder months and fall. Yes. Um, so Basically, if you are taking things down, let's say you're creating piles to kind of slowly put them in your yard debris bin, you're basically creating fuel piles right now if you're not able to get rid of those completely. Um, it's also really hot. And so you're, you could be overextending yourself, dehydrating yourself. So it's probably better if this is something, if you have a lot of work cut out for you, especially just wait until the fall. If you're in an area where you're allowed to do open burning or backyard burning, which most anybody close to Portland is not going to be allowed to do per DEQ. But if you are somebody that lives more in a rural area, that may be an option. Um, but really the fall is going to be the better time because even if you make those piles while you're slowly chipping away at putting those in the yard debris bin, that's not the wildfire season. So it's not going to be as risky. So thanks Karen for bringing that up. One of the um, questions I know in the pre- um, questions in the registration part, and that person may not be on anymore. What's about um, what if your the place you're planning on going um, to escape to your evacuation place? What if it's basically all your friends and family are in the evacuation areas as well? Which in September we kind of felt like everybody was in in those zones. I know I was thinking about where was I going to go because we felt like we were surrounded by fire. Um, try to, if you can, I know not everybody has an abundance of friends and family that they could potentially go to, but try to pick people in very different places, like maybe somebody in Vancouver, maybe somebody in Salem, or, you know, just kind of spread out a little bit geographically. And if that is the case where you can't go to either, there are emergency shelters and the emergency managers will open those up. And so again, when you're monitoring all of those, you know, whatever you're going to monitor, whether it's news sources, um, social media of the government agencies, Twitter, et cetera, um, they will let you know the shelter locations. I know it was easy for me to find that then. So even if you're going there for a couple of hours just to get your bearings straight or find a place to go, those are great options. They usually have space for animals, pets, things like that. So that's a good place to kind of get your head straight and take a breath and figure out your next move or your next step. There was something else you said in, a, in another time we were talking about if a person has an evacuation and there's only one street to that. Um, can you speak to that a little bit more? Yeah. Um, so I think, are you talking about when we were talking about the police um, with traffic control? Sorry, we've had this, we've had this a lot in different oh. Actually, no, not that one. I was I was speaking to like a person who lives in a in an area where there really is only one way out. Yeah. So with those folks, you definitely if you only have one way in and out of your neighborhood um, or, you know, that it's going to be very congested, even if you have maybe more than one. But if one of those areas could potentially be cut off, um, definitely leave at an earlier evacuation zone there. Um, what I thought Karen was asking to just I'll elaborate on this since we're talking about it. With the, our law enforcement partners helping with evacuations, the other thing that they do on a lot of our emergency incidents is traffic control. And so they have the ability to override the um, uh, street lights, uh, sorry, traffic signals. And so if you have a bunch of people come in, let's say from the north on that street and it has the potential to get congested, they may shut down the east-west street and just you know have that be a constant green to get everybody out of that area a lot quicker. And they're, we're, we're very grateful for our law enforcement partners because they help make all of that stuff a lot easier for us. But still, leave as soon as you can if you are in that situation. And that's something where Trace was talking about kind of driving your neighborhoods and identifying those alternate routes. Pay attention. Is that a potential for you? And if it is, then you really want to prepare yourself mentally to leave at an earlier level. In the discussion about... Uh, about uh... Uh, uh, social media. Don't forget AM 1610. Mm. If cell phone towers are down and, and you don't know what a tweet is, uh, uh, turn on your AM 1610 radio uh, station and uh, there should be information. 
Yes, definitely. We oh. too, we just discussed today, um, we are going to start doing wildfire Wednesdays on our um, TVF and our Facebook page. So first Wednesday of each month, we will have an actionable item for wildfire preparedness. So again, if this feels very overwhelming or that you have way too much to do, um, or, you know, sometimes we just need kind of reminders. If you don't follow us on, on Facebook and you have Facebook, um, make sure you do that. And then you'll get kind of these reminders of, okay, this month we're going to focus on creating our plan. And so that'll help kind of keep you in line too with what you learned today. Any other questions, Barbara? I didn't see any others really that came up that we haven't talked about. No, I just want to take a moment to thank Cedar Hills Ready for caring about this subject and asking us to be involved and engaged and more than that, getting a huge amount of participants. This is way more than we've been able to get. So we'll have to get some tips from you on attracting people. <laughs> uh, we appreciate you all having us in, and caring about this topic. Thank you so much. Um, we also would very much like to thank you for the time and effort that you put in uh, not only on this presentation for us, but all of the work that you do. Thank you so much. And thank you all of the people who attended tonight. Thank you for caring. Have a great summer. Come up with some good projects. <laughs>